Hello, welcome to Color Light Motion, created and hosted by Victoria Vesna. I'm Bess Rocklitzer, president of the David Bermant Foundation. Today we bring you Ivana Dama. Ivana is working on her graduate degree at Yale University and has all along been behind the scenes for Color Light Motion. It is our privilege to have Ivana here today, giving her own presentation from zero to infinity. Otto Pina, Zero Group, and their legacy on today's art. Please enjoy Ivana, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Bess, and thank you to the Berman Foundation for continuing to support Color Light Motion. We're starting a new series with the new lunar year of the dragon, 2024, with episode 22, when we feature Ivan Adama a young artist who's really interested in sound and is focusing her talk on the group Zero and the work of Otto Pina that's in the collection. Uh, we asked her, as we always ask our presenters, to recommend a respondent, and she invited Ross Whiteman, who is working at Yale, and they share the space there, uh, crossing over each other and sometimes discussing ideas around sound. So his, uh, his presence was very welcome. And we also had a great group uh, from UCLA, uh, Anuradha Vikram, co-curator of Atmosphere of Sound, Sonic Art in Times of Climate Disruption that we're doing for the Getty Pacific Standard Time was here as well as a couple of artists who are part of that show. Anna Nacher came to us from Poland, uh, Robertina Szebenic from Slovenia, Lena Ortega from Mexico came in. Uh, she will be writing about the project we're doing, and Gabriel Tolson, who is an uh, assistant to the curators. Um, I think that what's really beautiful is the people that came together, including our audience, uh, and in particular, uh, we had a great moment with Sally Weber, who, whose work is in the collection. And that work is called Threshold to Singularity, a Memorial from 1989. Beautiful work. So you can see it on our archive. Uh, what was wonderful about her joining is that we discovered she actually was a student of Agapine. And as a graduate student, really gained so much from being in that surrounding at that particular time. It must have been so exciting. And to get her feedback about how the connection that she saw between what Ivana was talking about in her work, dealing with sound and war and sirens, uh, and this kind of embedded um, trauma from being a child in Belgrade when the bombing happened, to um, Otto Pina and the Zero Group actually growing up in the Second World War with the trauma and afterwards dealing with it um, and trying to figure out ways to redirect this kind of violent energy that they were subjected to. Um, so all this to say is that this episode is wonderful. You will really enjoy seeing this connections and this intergenerational reflection on some of these works that are in the collection and that remain to be influential. Enjoy. Thank you, Victoria, and thanks for having me today. Um, I have to say that uh, this invitation came to me as a surprise, uh, of course, from Victoria, because I've been working on this series since the uh, very beginning of pandemic, uh, and I was uh, sort of working in production side of the Color Light Motion series and was really impressed with um, people who were invited. So some of my favorite curators, some of my favorite art historians, and specifically media art historians were part of this series, and some of my favorite artists, um, including Sally Weber that's here today. Um, so I am actually not just excited, I'm honored, and uh, to be honest, very nervous to be here today, but I also feel a little special um, kind of a privilege in a sense of starting this new series of emerging artists and, and sort of setting the, the kind of the, the, the step stone for, for, for that, which is kind of exciting um, to revive some of the 
pieces in the David Beaumont collection and see them from maybe perspective of, um, of like young artists like myself. Um, so with that, I will uh, start my screen share. I titled my um, lecture uh, From Zero to Infinity. And today I'll be focusing on Otto Pina's work and the work of Zero Group in general and how that had effect on the art that's happening today. And I will feature some of the artists um, that are in the collection. I will also feature some of the artists that I personally worked with or had a chance to collect, or collaborate with in the, um, in the past or I'm hoping to collaborate in the future. Um, so this series um, is, is titled Color Light Motion, but I add a little element of plus sound uh, because that's something I will be focusing on today. And I, and I also think that um, David Vermont Collection has incredible pieces that are actually sound pieces, um, but I, I just think that the sound was overlooked in the titling of the series. So I hope that that changes in the future, but I kind of had to um, add almost this plus sign as a, as a reminder of that. Um, so Zero Group uh, was sort of a historical group um, that now uh, is being more looked at in many different ways, but um, aesthetically uh, there is a lot of components to the Zero Group that I think are really uh, important to uh, some of the backgrounds and interests of aesthetic sensibilities that um, I'm working with. Um, although this, this group started um, in uh, sort of 60s in the post-war movements um, there was a, there was this disbalance of trying to create something new that i will uh, sort of explain um, in a little bit and i wanted to include to kind of start everything with including quotes for Otopina itself and he wrote this essay called Pat paths to paradise and these um, quotes are kind of taken out of that essay um, so he uh, he wrote and it was kind of like almost like a manifesto for the group uh, yes, I dream of a better world. Should I dream of the worse? Um, yes, I desire a wider, wider world. Or should I desire a nearer world? And so that kind of opens my uh, possibilities in a, as an artist. Yes, of course, we have these dreams and aspirations and kind of how we uh, combine them is important. And also the other quote uh, that was the, the be very beginning of their manifesto is explaining what zero is. So zero is silence, zero is beginning, zero is round, zero spins, zero is the moon, zero, the sun is zero, the desert is zero, um, the sky above is zero, and the night. Um, so on the right side of this slide, you can see um, the cover of the book that I will be referencing a lot today. And this was the, uh, actually the cover of the retrospective exhibition of the Zero Group in the Guggenheim Museum that was opened in 2014. And funny enough, in 2014 was exactly the time when I landed for the first time, um, kind of when I had idea that I'm coming to United States to, um, to start my undergraduate degree at UCLA. Um, but before, because the flight from Belgrade was uh, through New York, I spent a few days uh, in New York and I remember going to Guggenheim Museum and actually seeing this um, exhibition myself. In 2014, I had no idea who Otto Pina is and I was also not aware of the, a lot of work that was existing in the Zero Group. So um sort of the title that i chose subtitle that i chose for this slide is four three two one zero and that kind of sort of re re reflects this whole idea that they had about uh rocket launch and use, like losing almost this like um this force of a rocket and the, the really time that exists in between the one and zero zero and before the actually rocket launches itself so that that's the space that they are um sort of in a broad way interested in, at least from my perspective. Um, I also included that uh, one more quote, and I think that these quotes are helping me uh, get into the head of these artists because in a lot of ways I cannot relate to them, uh, but in a lot of ways I, I, I share similar sensibilities uh, to them. Um, so one of the quotes that Otto also said was that uh, one glance at the sky, at the sun, at the sea is enough to show that the world outside man is bigger than um, inside him. So I would just change the, these pronouns to possibly a human, 
uh, and not be focused on men. And that's kind of one of the other issues of this group that it was predominantly um, men and focused in uh, Germany. The group started in Düsseldorf um, in actually 1950s. Uh, and their whole idea was to change the narrative that existed uh, in the post-war era. Um, they were trying to find something new, um, to find something autonomous, to start, to start a new artistic be beginning. And in a lot of essays that I was reading about the group, they were constantly using freeing art as a term, um, which a lot of, in a lot of ways is kind of problematic today because if it sort of comes with this idea of optimistic um, optimistic future in the post-war era, but unfortunately we all learned that, um, that, um, that it wasn't that optimistic after all. Um, but I will focus on just their ideology at the very beginning of my presentation. Um, and this was the, the title of the exhibition, and I'm using it also as a subtitle in my presentation, it is Come Down to a New Beginning. And that was the title of the exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, this come down is exactly what I was talking about earlier, is exactly 43210. Um, and some of these, I, like, I think I'm repeating myself in this slide, but I'm also just emphasizing the importance of this um, wave of optimism, as I, as I titled it here. Um, so it's the sort of utopian, idealistic, um, conventional ideas, and then the play of light and shadow, stillness and movement. Um, and they're kind of contrasting each other to emphasize each other more. Um, and also, um, I will just uh, begin the, the And uh, as a painter, I, uh, with this video. I used stencils. And from there came projecting light into space. Mm -hmm. The idea of the rasters just came from using lights that could shine through these perforated cardboard panels and metal panels. The development, the evolution of sculpture, of metal sculpture in my work. Yeah. So at the very beginning of this video, this was the interview that was done um, with Otto uh, before the exhibition was starting uh, to be kind of like laid out. And one of, the, one of the things that he was constantly saying was that he started as a painter, but he wasn't using traditional um, sort of a canvas and paint and a brush. He was more interested in stencils. And I think this he, the obsession that he had with stencils as a negative, positive space, and also the, again, the reflection of light, goes back to that cover of the book uh, again of what we see through when we open the book and and sort of I think that's uh, the ground um, of his work and how, how he started um, thinking about these light ballet uh, sculptures. Um, here are some of the other works in the in the same exhibition uh, that I'll be talking about uh, but one of the the beautiful things um, to me personally is that uh, this specific piece, Light, Light Ballet, reflect, it reflects in a lot of ways um, to the work, other work that he was doing later on. Um, and so um, I, will, I will just move to the next slide, hopefully. Um, so this sort of movement was um, in a lot of ways connecting groups of artists who shared um, similar um, either aesthetic sensibilities or interest in informal aesthetics. So when I'm talking about the formal aesthetics, I think uh, their obsession with air really resonates with me. Their obsession with light really resonates with me. Um, but more than anything, their obsession with vibrations um, is what is kind of important to my work that I'll be talking about later. Um, so in terms of uh, in terms of vibrations, I, I think that uh, in a lot of sense, uh, this is uh, they're seeing the light as a, as a as a material that can be uh, they can fill in the room. Similarly to sound and similarly to air, um, it's almost the hard material to work with as an artist because it's hard to capture, it's hard to organize, it's hard to maintain. So we'll go back again to my slide and just emphasize this um, um, inflatable project right here, 
it's almost kind of like I, this like visualization of this exact thing of trying to capture the air to give a form um, to to sort of just to just have that as as a background. I I also thought of um, the magazine that they started. It's of course called Zero Magazine, and specifically the issue two of the magazine is focused only on vibrations and the work of artists that were focused on, uh, on exploring this uh, further. Um, so in, um, in kind of engaging the viewers in multi-sensory experience was one of their uh, very basic ideas. Um, so they would say that they're creating environments that offer result in resonating energy or this vibration of light and movement that can be seen through kinetic works of uh, art. Um, then the innovative use of materials, technologies to produce the works that were dynamic, um, and they try to kind of break the boundaries of artwork and the viewer and the environment in one space. Uh, so here are a few more uh, things from uh, the book that um, I'm using, and um, this approach kind of represents a significant almost departure from traditional forms of art uh, in a sense of stat static forms. So it is giving a new dimensionality to it and um, a new emphasis of, um, of change. And I think this idea of change really uh, is, resonates in this work by Otto as well. And these are the round discs that he created. And there is, um, there is two of them. Uh, one of them is called Raster Mond, and the other one is called Raster Sun. So um, these are um, the works that one of them refers to formation uh, of sun and the other one of the moon. Um, and he particularly chose to work with metal. And in the right side, uh, he's using brass. And in the left side, he's using aluminum uh, panels to sort of have the even though these are the wall piece they are still they're not moving um the reflection of light in the space um is the movement that he was particularly interested in um and so in in this in in the in this work uh there are some elements of dynamic visual effects and they're sort of intended to evoke an image of essence or of the sun um and so now i think that in this work, this is sort of a connection of intersection between art, nature, and technology uh, in a lot of ways um, sort of resonates with the work that was done um, in a similar time by Paul Burry, uh, titled Punctuation, uh, where there's a multi-layer um, stencils that are moving with a simple motor on the wood panel and they're revealing the image that also um, reassembles this like, kind of like almost moon phases. And on the right side is Marcel Duchamp's uh, pieces that are actually in the David Vermont collection. And um, this is one of my one of my favorite pieces in the uh, in the David Vermont collection because of uh, potential for art to exist in places that are not just museums and galleries, and particularly. Uh, this piece um, was intended to be a home art. Uh, this is, um, it's, it's, it was created in, with a very simple turntable-like motor uh, where uh, you can, where the sort of um, audience or owners of these discs can replace them and have a diff different visual effects uh, in their houses. Uh, so the movement that would be created by these uh, discs was uh, particularly inspiring to some of the artists that I will um, mention later on today. Um, I also cannot possibly, in, in the very short uh, lecture, I cannot possibly cover um, everything that the Zero Group did, and I also am um, missing a lot of names and missing a lot of, of works. So I decided to scan through uh, the book just so um, we get the more of this like kind of aesthetic sensibility of the group that we get a sense of the work and maybe recognize some of the pieces uh, from the from the previous um, works and so even if if while I'm looking at this video I'm looking at uh, Mokhari Naj's piece uh, that was 
very inspirational to me uh, as well that's using uh, movement and um, and discs uh, to reflect the light in the room and I will um, also mention a few artists today and one of them uh, that is Roji Akeda and I think that this <laughs> sort of optimism that existed in the very uh, beginning of the group is not something that we can talk about today because right now is about 60 or I think 64 plus years uh, since the movement started and this uh, sort of uh, reality that we live in is as we all know less optimistic and less utopian in a lot of ways it's challenging for artists like myself to identify with the work of the zero group um, specifically because of these um, kind of like issues of rejecting to create a work that has any sort of social and activist meaning. Um, but I wanted to kind of emphasize some of the people who are uh, working today who are definitely inspired and they also write about the Zero Group a lot and one of them is Roger Keda. This is a piece that I saw in person at Venice Biennale in a couple of years ago, I think 2019, and it's part of his work's title Spectra. There was multiple um, Spectra pieces. Uh, I, was, I was particularly interested in uh, this piece because it's emphasizing um, the environmental crisis that we are going through. So the artist decided to include enormously bright lights of, um, of fluorescent lights in the short uh, gallery uh, space and there was almost like a hallway, a reconstructed hallway that the audience had to go through and walk through to see other exhibitions. It was, um, it was so painful to go through this space. You, people would hold their eyes uh, closed, it would, some people would have sunglasses. Um, but I'm, I'm also interested in this oversaturated um, creation uh, that he did that would emphasize um, sort of dystopian uh, approach to tomorrow. Um, that's almost contrary to the, the, to the movement, to the zero movement, uh, but aesthetically so similar. Um, on the next slide, I have uh, David Roy, and uh, he is um, the artist who was in the uh, Artside Collective right now at UCLA, and he also graduated from the Yale Sculpture Department uh, a couple of years ago. And David works um, really resonates with me because of his um, multidisciplinary practice that uh, sort of has elements of, of objects and sculptures, but also has elements of sound and music and experimentation. And I think that um, David is one of the people that I personally like to work with uh, because of openness to uh, try and experiment with new things. But one of his long-term projects is titled Black NASA. And although he has similar obsession with a lot of members of the Zero Group with rockets and this launching and the new tomorrow. Uh, David is also at the same time reflecting to, um, to the current um, a moment by, um, by sort of reflecting that, that uh, there should be alternative NASA and there should be space uh, for people of color in uh, these institutions. And so all of his rockets are created um, for peace. So he titles a lot of his work as Rockets for Peace. Uh, which is not a lot of times the way we are using rockets um, today. Um, I will also jump into a few other uh, uh, other works in the collection, uh, not in the collection, but uh, other works of art that are um, really relevant. So this group is um, titled uh, Experimental Jet Set, and they are almost building an online archive of the artists who and designers um, were really important um, for even today, or they started, I think, in, um, in Amsterdam, um, I would say, of, like, around the time of like 70s, but it's super relevant to today um, collection. So I don't know if you can see the my screen right now, but I'm currently sharing uh, 
their website um, and I'm just gonna open a couple of pieces um, more for uh, this idea of the aesthetic sensibility. And I also think how important was graphic elements of the um, of the zero group uh, that are reflected in uh, in today's um, uh, in today's graphic design. And after the experimental jet set group, I will talk about um, Alexandra Jovanić. That's actually, um, if I'm still uh, correct, is hopefully with us today, and we'll have a chance to chat at the very end. Um, Alexandra is one of my great friends and is um, sort of working uh, with new series of work. And I wanted to to show uh, this piece in particular because it directly reminds me to uh, the thinking of Marcel Duchamp and bringing this um, bringing the art outside of art galleries and also using a simple rotation to create very complex movements. Uh, here are some of the experiments that she was doing recently, and she was cutting out of these discs out of cardboard. We're potentially thinking about collaborating in the future and creating sound um, engravings, or, or almost like a, a record, so they can be both visual and sound um, um, piece. But I will, I will try to share. One second, I will try to share this website as well. Um, so thinking about how uh, the the art is also reflecting the time that's created. Um, Alexander created this website where you can actually, uh, every time you refresh, you have a new design. So the importance of generative art and uh, sort of the endless amount of results. So I can only imagine uh, what would take Marcel Duchamp to do these calculations almost in an analog way and to create one of these disks and it was just a very time consuming and probably a lot of trial and error. But right now, um, the beauty of Alexandra's piece is that you can have <laughs> absolutely endless number of these, um, these disks and every time I'm refreshing, I'm having a completely new result. Um, and that's something that is sort of uh, important to me is how do we reflect on the current times, but how we also look at back at the past and look at what was done before and sort of create an um, um, uh, important narrative uh, between. This was, I just had to include this last minute into my presentation. This was in 941, <laughs> I can see it on the clock in the corner. Um, me driving to campus today um, from, I'm currently located in New Haven, uh, that's where Yale University is. Um, so I'm sort of um, interested in, um, I will share how my work forms, but a lot of times I lived in California for a long time and it was a different uh, political environment that it is here in uh, New Haven. So I just inclu included this video that really upset me <laughs> this morning of um, a group of uh, men standing in front of the Planned Parenthood um, uh, uh, facilities. So I am also, I, do, I don't think that the work that Zero Group was doing is even possible today because as soon as we walk outside, we just either have to isolate ourselves from everything, but as soon as we walk outside, there's just, you're bombarded with these um, different uh, types of realities. So with that, I kind of wanna, uh, share some of my personal work, and this is the piece uh, that I titled, I don't know if you can hear us, although you're being very loud. And this was the opening statement um, in the Congress, of, one of the Congresswomen was talking about the women's rights um, and the abortion laws in the United States. So I am personally uh, really shocked that in, in today's society, we live in one of the most um, developed countries on earth and that I feel um, that I have less uh, human rights that uh, my, my mom had um, that when she was my age living in, in Serbia and yeah, ex-Yugoslavia. So it's quite shocking how kind of a lot of times things are going um, backwards. Um, in this piece, I was uh, kind of interested in showing that in more scientific way because of um, difficulties to talk about these topics as a, as a young woman. 
Um, so I, I included um, a vacuum chamber, aluminum egg timer, and stainless steel cable. Um, and every time that aluminum egg timer would ding, uh, we are not able to hear it because there is no um, there is no oxygen inside of box. So actually, air sound travels through air and requires um, air particles to um, for something to vibrate or resonate. Um, and if we use the the vacuum uh, pump to remove that air. Uh, even though the object is ringing and producing the sound, uh, outside experience of the audience is not, not able to, to hear that. So I sort of reflect that to, again, to idea of silencing um, these uh, voices that, 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 um, that we hear. Similarly, in, in this piece, um, it's titled Audible Silence. I used two of these chambers and I placed the air raid sirens that are originally used to signal bombing in my hometown to sort of silence them again and talk about these um, uh, almost like political uh, oppression and uh, the different pos positioning um, as myself as an artist um, in these topics. Um, and then I will today, I will add, end uh, my lecture today by sharing some of the research that I'm currently doing for the future piece and the piece that will be part of my thesis here at Yale. Um, so I was recently visiting the collection of historical scientific instruments at Harvard University, and they uh, particularly have a lot of uh, pieces in collection by Rudolf Koenig, who is um, one of the really important makers and inventors from France, uh, who developed a lot of uh, bases for air raid silence. Um, in, the pre in the research that I was doing for the last uh, couple of years, I'm also interested in how does the sound of air raid silence connect to electronic music and development of analog um, synthesizers. So I was particularly looking into a relationship of the two and I couldn't, as, a, as someone who was uh, sort of obsessed with these things based on the background that Victoria was talking about and these like sonic memories that I had as a child uh, living in, in Belgrade. Um, I, was, I, was, I was really drawn to these uh, opal, opal discs, siren discs, that are essentially just the pieces of cardboard. Um, and these are some footage images from my phone while I was in the collection looking at these discs. Um, so these are the, the discs that came with a series of holes um, on them. And if you spin uh, one, one of these discs and you even have a light air pressure, even as a straw, um, um, you're using a straw and the disc is spinning, you can activate uh, different pitch and the frequency or how often these holes are showing on, are, are being on the disc itself uh, uh, would um, change the, the specific tone. Um, so I saw that there is a potential for sort of musical in, in, instrumentation in these, uh, in these discs. Oh, that's my brother. So these are um, just the videos from my phone because I'm right now in the working stage of this project. So I included just some of the experiments that I was doing in the Wright lab in the um, in this in this machining shop at Yale University. So I, I do work a lot as as Victoria mentioned. I'm assistant director of the Art and Science Center at UCLA, and since 2019, I've been constantly. Uh, involving myself into projects where I don't necessarily need a group of artists to talk to. I love spending time in, in science places and just hearing the way scientists think about uh, solving some of the issues or their approaches and then taking my own direction uh, from there. Uh, so I started a series of um, now um, all different kinds of experimentations in, in the lab where we were testing out and trying out what would produce what kind of sound, what patterns would create what. And in the midst of that, my obsession with this disc um, grew into obsession into looking at 
disc itself, um, both visually and also uh, sonically, is how simple it is to produce the sound. So as the disc spins, it's almost like interruption of the air, and it's almost like a blade that spins and cuts the air as it goes. So that simple movement, again, and, uh, and controlled air is something I am interested in. In the, in the vacuum pieces I'm also sh that I showed earlier, I'm interested in using the air as a medium. All of the, the pieces are talking about other social and, um, issues. Um, they're also purely using um, the sound and air as, as medium, as almost like a material. And that's how I see my sculptural work. I don't necessarily see it as like object making because it's not so much about objects, but it is more about this um, materiality of, of sound and air. Um, and so in all these experiments, um, I'm now including some of the renderings of how I'm possibly seeing this being resolved as a exhibit, more like exhibition uh, piece. So I'm thinking now back to looking back into our pieces of the Zero collection and Zero uh, group and um, sort of solving and dealing with similar issues that they had, but also thinking what are the things that couldn't be done uh, when these original uh, silent discs were created. So in 1800s, when Kuni uh, designed these discs, op Opel Sirens, uh, they were sort of they were working with drill press and they didn't have what we have today like cnc routers and uh, laser cutters and whatnot so i'm potentially interested in engraving um, different sorts of patterns and mapping on these discs that can have the meanings in the spacing of the holes so i was i was thinking okay these silent discs were created to sort of as a kind of urgency signals, but I'm also thinking about them as, um, as, as like today, what are the urgencies that are happening by now? What are the, the issues that are important by now? And I am almost like most of us probably overwhelmed with, um, with news, overwhelmed with everything that's, that, that's happening every day. So I cannot possibly cover every, every single issue. So what I decided to do is to create a um, collaborative project where I would invite um, different artists that, um, that are working with sound um, in a different capacity. And I would ask them to design a disc uh, with something that's important to them. This can be ranging from ecological issues to social, economic, or racial issues. So I'm seeing the, 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 the particular interest of, that I am interested in is that um, perspective that I have is very limited and I'm aware of that. So I'm trying to open this up and create a playground for, for others to, to share what's important to them. And I learned also when I was really young how important it is to be um, around other people in the times of urgencies. So it's quite incredible how uh, when it, there was a bombing of Belgrade, it's quite incredible how many people came together and even if the neighbors didn't talk to each other about now, when, the, when these sirens would be activated and we had to move to a shelter, everyone was working together. Um, so I do think that the potential for for collaborative work and creating the work that's not just about a single artist. Um, so kind of like looking what Zero Group was doing was really important to me because they did, although they did work as individual, they had individual practices and artists, they also did a lot of collaborative works and a lot of works that was just for the movement. And I think kind of looking back at that and sort of creating these collections and seeing what um, comes out of it. So with that, I'll wrap my presentation today and thank you everyone and I'm looking forward to our conversation after. How wonderful is that? Hello, Nina. Nice to see you. I'll call you. And there's Lena Ortega. Everybody, please join. Um, I really enjoyed this, Ivana. You know, this is a bit of a testament how when you work with someone and there's a community we have 
you, you lose sight of how important their work is. And this is very much my impetus about inviting Ivana that, uh, and, and also Ross for that, for you know, coming in together to give a discussion. So what we're going to do is um, talk a little bit about what Ivana showed. And I'll just say from my side that I'm repeatedly struck by the maturity of your work and, and at the same time how events in your childhood influenced your whole way of searching for expression that now is probably more important than ever. And I said probably, it is more important than ever because there are so many children as we speak who are having similar and much, much worse experiences. And one of the things that um, really struck with me, and I mentioned it even earlier, but I keep thinking about it, is that you were, when you were describing to me being in this basement that was three floors down, you actually didn't hear these sirens. And I find that pretty amazing that these vibrations, also what the Zero Group was looking at, the, the vibrations that we don't hear, are still influencing us and how much we're ignoring it uh, collectively or a lot of people who are in charge are ignoring it. These vibrations are affecting all of us, even if we're three and five floors down, even if geographically we're miles and miles away. Um, so thank you so much for that. It's really inspiring to me and I'm sure to everybody else. So I'm gonna pass it on first to Ross to give us your feedback, I'm very curious because I can see how you guys are really connected uh, with your work. Thanks so much, Victoria. Yeah, Ivana, um, so great to get even more background on this work. We spoke in your studio, I guess it was earlier this week, um, and you shared some of the ideas of collaborations and some of the ideas of the uh, you know possible connections that different artists might have. Um, whether that's importing kind of data structures or different types of like um, mathematical structures onto these disks um, to describe something um, in this medium. Um, there's so much here that I, I gained um, from hearing about Zero Group, um, especially the, the concept of the countdown. I wanted to talk about that a little bit because um, the countdown, you know, there's, it can, evoke this excitement um, and this optimism, but also doom and fear. Um, I think it's really interesting also relating that to like the medium um, working with stenciling um, and cutting, engraving. Um, you're playing with the concept of negative, positive. Um, are you thinking about these types of relationships? I know you're, you're sort of focusing the talk on um, zero groups, uh, kind of optimism um, and in the face, as you said, of today, there's so many things that um, are troubling in the world. Um, and obviously back then there were too, I think now it's um, a bigger, maybe part of the issue is, or not issue, but there's just so much information. Um, I'm curious how you're kind of thinking about um, these things I, I realize that you you kind of very elegantly like said i want to collaborate with people to kind of get their perspectives which would be wider than mine um which relates to that quote you shared at the beginning um i was wondering if you could kind of talk a bit about that like playing with negative positive and kind of spinning it on an optimism or fear level and also like in the medium um and things you've discovered along the way I think that's such an important question because it's not just from the from the perspective of spinning these discs and hearing them, but I think from perspective of what that negative space um, and what the like kind of like positive and negative space and their relationship similar to what the zero group was doing with light and and, and sort of the light and shadow. So that we need both um, to exist, and it's not one or the other. And I think that's really the beauty of um of working together with other artists including yourself you're uh, i have to mention that ross is one of the people that invited um to be collaborator on this project and i also like i just think that it's the the, the crucial element for me personally 
is um, the, the kind of like the balance or finding the thread between. And a lot of times I'm struggling to understand the ideas uh, like let's go back to something you said earlier about the rockets and this kind of like launching and almost like the the aspirational break free from um from something that was like holding us um so i, I relate in that sense to zero group that they had this they, they had this huge urgency to break free from traditional art and to kind of explode almost and explore these territories that are unknown um, and, and they were also at the same time mirroring the, the era of um, space explorations in 60s. So we have at the same time, we have mm -hmm. Russia, we have Solaris, Tarkovsky movie, we have at the same time uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. So all of these aesthetic sensibilities, aspirations are reflected in the work of the group itself. But they're coming um, to me personally in the more kind of from more um, what, like I'm thinking, what are we breaking from right now? And, and we are sort of, all of us are tired from um, ongoing, we, I'm constantly hearing we live in unprecedented times. And it's just absolutely always like this kind of like in, in, in stable times are just, it seems like not ending. And that continuation of it, really makes me feel like this, almost like we need this rocket launch to, <laughs> to mm -hmm. break free from, from, from this. Um, so in that sense, I, I do uh, relate to the group uh, in terms of rockets and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, kind of launching. Um, yeah. I think it's really interesting also like, sorry. As, oh, sorry, if, if I could say one more thing, I just love that you, um, that you're kind of very elegantly like, taking one of your main critiques of the group and like in your own work um expanding your own horizons of what this medium that you're working with can be so for instance like zero group as you mentioned like pronoun wise and kind of rhetoric wise is like a very male dominant group same with like if you look at the italian futurists and things like this so i think it's really elegant that you're widening your perspective through these collaborations with other people via this medium um, and kind of launching yourself outside of your own, um, you know, we all have our kind of narrower visions of the world because we're all individuals. So I think that's really, um, was really striking to me with your presentation. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and thanks for being here today. On a lighter note, I will say that um, I found out secondhand through the Berman Foundation that David Berman used that piece as his uh, coffee table. Well, of course, yeah. That's, I mean, that's quite incredible how- um, <laughs> It's very how, 70s also to do that. Yes, and I was, as I was preparing for this talk, I was looking in um, changes in installation that David Bermond did over time. Uh, so I even saw, um, it was hard to find the videos from Butler Museum where the piece is right now installed but uh from what i was able to look at the map it, it, it seems like it's in the smaller room so it's it's just one piece on its own and i really think about that um quite often is uh how uh, my first visit to guggenheim uh, exhibition of the zero group was so um i didn't know anything about that movement i didn't know anything about the artist but it was so powerful as a regular visitor to the gallery of how that slowly seeing the light move and fill in the space and how simple the tech, just it was just one motor spinning a disc and 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 sort of creating this um the full room of um of, of light um so that was kind of like a, almost like a theater uh feeling yeah. of Line. It's it's interesting you're bringing that up because Christian Paul, uh, who was the artist in residence at the foundation, she was asked uh, along with David Familian and uh, Karen Moss, their curators, and they all said, oh, you know, this piece needs to have its own space. And when David Familian and Karen Moss were there, they literally just made the room with with best best. Do you remember that was a whole production too? But it made a huge difference because when it was in a group 
open space, it, the whole reflection got lost. And that it's, it's all about the reflection. It's all about the light. Uh, so you were just focusing on the object and not really getting the whole point that it becomes immersive in this very simple kind of way um, that's actually gorgeous. So Anna Nahir is joining us. Uh, she has a question for you, Ivana. Hi, Anna. Um, hi, Ivana. <clears throat> Thank you so much for, for a wonderful talk and um, uh, such 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 amazing works, you know, frankly, I'm really moved uh, by your work about silence women's voices, uh, and I find it particularly relevant, you know, um, uh, considering, you know, where I speak from, I mean, Poland, right, the country in Europe that has one of the strictest um, abortion laws, but um, uh, uh, just a, a couple of, I mean, just, just two months ago, basically, two or three, uh, months ago, uh, we had elections, and it seems like the situation changed dramatically uh, to um, uh, for, for better. Uh, so there is hope, I must say, because this case seems to be really, um, uh, really uh, lost to battle. But now it seems quite opposite. Uh, according to recent polls, uh, more than 50%, around 56% of Polish people are in favor of uh, legalizing abortion. So, uh, so <clears throat> it, it really changes. I, I think that this notion of um, uh, uh, human rights, kind of, you know, the, the, all, all the issues around human rights moving backwards rather than, you know, uh, forwards is really interesting, but I, I have an impression that it can be back and forth, and that if we don't pay attention, it may really um, deteriorate, right? So also, for, from this point of view, your work is just amazing. Um, my question would be, uh, did you think about um, the earth and, and the air and breathing as well in this <laughs> work? Because it seems to me that uh, it really ties in nicely with, you know, my point of interest, which is, of course, breath and breathing, because um, what I see in your work, uh, how I read it, is that we're silenced and, uh, when we can't speak, you know, we also can't breathe, sort of, that that would be very crude uh, interpretation, so that, that would be my question. And and just as a footnote, you know, there, is a, there was a wonderful work by Otto Pine, uh, commissioned in Minneapolis in 1976, um, red helium balloons that were um, that were flying, you know, and th th this is amazing. I, I see certain connections with your work because those balloons were shot by, you know, people who were kind of outraged by, by this kind of, uh, you know, large scale contemporary work. So there was this kind of, you know, violence from um, the audience as well. And I think and the work that your work that I'm referring to is also sort of hinting in this at this kind of violence. So so that that's you know I I moved I know that I'm sort of um, chaotic, but I was just you know so um, uh, inspired by by your work that I have like you know lots of thoughts and really uh, I'm I'm getting um, ecstatic almost you know ecstatic by by, <laughs> by what you presented. So sorry about being chaotic, but you know. Yeah, the uh, question about yeah, care and you're breathing. not chaotic. I actually um, feel that just seeing who showed up for you, Ivana, <laughs> this is the beautiful thing because it's really about community and the community of artists who we are building uh, are amazing people. And to have them actually show up, including Anna and Lena Ortega. Um, it's just wonderful. So yeah, it's yeah, very I mean, inspiring. It sort of comes back to a community that you, Victoria, started building um, more than twenty, almost twenty years ago now. And and these people are part of my community now, but they're sort of coming from the Art Science Center. And uh, Anna, I really appreciate your comment. I just briefly want to say that the balloon pieces are, I actually, at the beginning of the last year, I made the inflatable um, <laughs> inflatable structure as well. I wasn't aware that uh, Otto was working on inflatable um, projects. It's, it's something that I learned recently while I was researching for, to prepare for this presentation. And I was like, oh, there's so many correlations with the mm -hmm. things that I was doing. But I think it's unconsciously in the same wavelength and yes. same, um, same, 
think, thinking again about these uh, vibrations and containment, um, it kind of goes back. Um, I'm just gonna also briefly mention about the breathing that you asked. Um, breathing is definitely really important and I'm sort of trying to, um, to bring that more in this piece of the, the disc. Um, so I'm considering of sort of having a, almost like a tubes as a performers that I would uh, breathe into these discs to just show at the very beginning of performance to possibly show the simplicity of the, that it's not a high tech um, piece that is very actually um, a bodily rhythm that can, that can create the, uh, the rhythmic structure or like a base for for uh, for these discs to, to spin and create a sound, um, so I'm I'm very much aware of it, and I um, I saw also that Clinton was here earlier, and we collaborated on a piece uh, for Artist Electronica Festival in He's 2000. still here. He's still here. So Hi everyone. Hi everyone. So we worked on a piece together that was just uh, oh, connected to breathing and kind of emphasizing the the social economical injustices and we activated the plants in botanical garden at, um, at ucla where we would touch them and they would send the morse code uh, signal that was um, um, kind of encoded about uh, breathing so it was kind of like this uh, almost like sirens or signals sent by plants that is the time to like kind of like wake up calls um from that perspective that was a really wonderful piece and uh early on they were just beginning their undergraduate kind of after santa monica college amazing uh so lena welcome welcome where are you coming from where are you beaming in from remind us hi i'm coming in from uh valle de bravo in mexico two hours away uh from mexico city in a beautiful forest and thank you, um, Ivana, for your presentation and for bringing the presentation forward with a critical perspective over time. That was, uh, I really enjoyed that. I wanted to ask you about, I see that you uh, weave uh, vibroacoustics and cycloacoustics in your work to create an atmosphere um, that will bring forward uh, social issues that you, we, uh, that you care so much about. How, how does this happen? How do you do this weaving uh, to create an atmosphere that will bring them forward? Uh, so, how um, can you can you expand a little bit more? Yes, I see that you use uh, vibroacoustics in your work, the effects on sound on the physical body, as well <laughs> as psychoacoustics, the effect of sound in our nervous system and our memory. And you use both of them in your work, and you weave them together to create. Uh, mm -hmm. an atmosphere that will bring forward uh, the issue that you would want to talk about. How do you do that? Like, uh, how do I, you weave them together? I think that's the question that I ask myself <laughs> probably every day, uh, but I can, I can probably not answer this in a, in a good way, but I'll try to mention a couple of uh, things that might be relevant. So while I was, going to see this scientific collection at Harvard and it's like all like science it's a, it's literally located in a science center I also looked on the right side and they said that it was used for psychoacoustics the it was um the collect the person that is curator of the collection told me oh we actually uh, these discs were not part of the original collection at Harvard they were moved to our collection uh from the psychology department and that <laughs> I was, I was, okay. <laughs> that says everything. That, that, that answers your question, Lena, completely. <laughs> That's okay, so amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm an accident, but I'm like, okay, of course, what else I could have. Of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sort of, um, yeah, so it's called Psychoacoustics Lab at uh, Harvard, and they had, um, they had a lot of experiments that were in, and I, I can share my screen right now, they were in the 40s, um, sort of part of the initiative to reduce the noise uh, of the pilots uh, during the war because of the structure in the airplanes and whatnot. So a lot of Koenig's uh, objects and developments were specifically related to, um, to this collection. And um, 
and I was looking directly into loudspeakers, I was looking directly into sirens, and uh, some of the CUNYX inventions at the very early are uh, trying to create devices for years that would only allow you to hear one tone at a time. And they were um, then the sort of in the, so the kind of neuroscientists now are investigating that of like this isolations of tones and effects and so there's just very little uh, research because it's so hard to prove these things so from my point of view I have a strong um, strong just connection to analog music synthesizers and I was really drawn into this structure of synthesizers itself and I never knew why I was not interested in any other instruments um, so, and then as I was growing up researching, I learned that there's quite a few also women artists who, um, um, who were inspired by similar things. And one of them was talking about growing up in Blitz in UK. So we're talking about different geographic locations and she had experience of hearing uh, air raid sirens. And then later on, she's seeing that as like early electronic music because the sound waves are coming as a constant. And then everything you do with synthesizers, you're affecting that sound wave with effects, with envelope shapers, with whatnot. You're just affecting that one wave that's coming in versus the other instruments that when you interact with piano or with a violin, it stops and you stop. So it's kind of like that constant. Mm -hmm. is so going back to your uh, question, I really don't have the answer, but all of these things are sort of connected and there's no proof. So that I'm not doing a scientific research and I'm not trying to sort of make the the point off of it but i'm kind of like interested in these correlations and ma mapping them in my own head um so i would say like i kind of solve them through mapping and through through writing too so you could say it's more of a experience and uh a feel that you have like a, you feel it and that's how you relate them i know that the, it, yeah, trying to prove it scientifically, I think it's one of the things that <laughs> always puts, I mean, it, it, it makes things not have uh, the weight that they should, or communication have the weight that they should, or uh, sound communication have the weight that they should because it's not scientifically proven, but it is happening. And those things, they do correlate in, in your work and other works that you showed. And at the same time, people have influence on their bodies with the vibration, and at the same time, influence also on their nervous system and their memory, and just so many uh, different layers of reality that come together with sound, through sound, on different That's levels. Right. And so, memory is something that actually is a recurring keyword with Ivana's work, uh, in my opinion, but it's also to your point, Lena, and in general, this idea of scientific proof, the problem is the methodology of science at this point. Very difficult to prove anything that's uh, dealing with complexity. So the methodology is very reductionist, and when you start dealing with so many different aspects and disciplines and variations and invisible, visible, there's nothing that you can do in a reductionist way. And this conflict is really happening now in real time because science has reached a point where the methodology has to change. And this is where I think art and science can really start flowing together and we can, we can help in this process. <laughs> I think there's a lot for scientists to get from that. Speaking of uh, this question, Anuradha just joined us and uh, it's wonderful that you're here taking the time, Anna. Um, oh, my pleasure, Ivana. It was such a good talk. I really enjoyed it very much. Um, love to see you do this. And I love this emerging artist. But I also wanted to shout out to Sound because our exhibition for PST Art is, of course, Atmosphere of Sound. Um, so maybe we should consider renaming the series. Um, maybe we'll have a meeting about that next week. Uh, my thinking, <laughs> I have so many questions um, and comments about what you've shown um, I was definitely thinking about when you showed the perforated discs that make the sound for the air raid sirens, which is fascinating, by the way. Um, it's in a certain way kind of similar to how, you know, a player piano or other mechanical forms of automated music are operated. Um, and of course, we're thinking a lot now about artificial intelligence 
in art. So that was one association. I'm just going to give you some associations and maybe ask you to respond about it because I don't really think I can formulate a question at 10 30 a.m on a Saturday <laughs> but um the other question or, or idea that came to mind was around um you're invoking Duchamp and Duchamp's optical art interests specifically um and I thought about what Victoria said about the exhibition at, of the zero group and the work that was um in one way sort of uh, aesthetically neutralized by the museum space and of course when we see Duchamp kinetic works or really any mid-century kinetic works in the museum space they're almost never operational um and they become objectified and entombed i would say in a certain way um so that's another point perhaps to respond to and then the third was um very interested in the piece that you showed involving the vacuum chamber um and i was curious about whether you had to do anything with the stainless steel table um with respect to physical contact between the timer, the glass of the vacuum chamber and the table producing any sort of vibration um, or whether that too is sufficiently dampened by the lack of air. So um, that's that's it for me. Thank you again for this wonderful talk. That's uh, actually the, the last uh, comment that you just made is um, what kind of is more obvious in the siren piece because sirens are much louder and so there's a, a piece of rubber holder that I made uh, that is sort of like absorbing the vibrations uh, of the siren itself. Um, of course, it's not perfect. There's like a, a, like a, a kind of like leaking sound and I can, yeah, I can share my screen and, and share the video documentation of it. But I think it's uh, just interesting to talk about that as like, okay, again, we are going back to conversation of like, we don't have to hear it. Um, and and sort of like this if you even touch the, the the chamber you can feel the 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 vibrations but they're transferred through sound but they're probably on a smaller level so it's not hearable in a, in a, in a gallery space if the vacuum is on um but uh, going back to your uh previous comment uh yes about the shop and unfortunately in the most museums we don't uh necessarily have a way to interact and i think that's the beauty of this work was the, the sort of like playfulness and trying out different discs and right now it's like like the rarity of these objects and that's why I kind of like to share of what Alexand Alexandra Jovanić is doing in Belgrade and this kind of generative um, so how can you use something that was already developed and and almost going back to your first question about AI how can some of these conversations enter um, designs of the discs. How can we make now that we have fabrication, digital fabrication tools, and now that we have um, all different kinds of um, designing and machine learning tools, um, how can we incorporate that into um, today's uh, discs and today's uh, urgencies? So I think that the Zero Group, if they were working today, I think that's what they would be also looking into. Uh, so yeah, you you posted Alexandra's link in the chat. I think Alexandra is here with us. Um, I hope she says hi. Um, but yeah, that's the artist that um, I, I referred to earlier. Yeah, so I can say hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> hi, all. Thanks. Hello. Are you coming in from Belgrade? Yes, I'm coming in from, from Belgrade. Great. So, you know, to, to the points that everybody's making, I just wanted to bring up something that you and I talked about, Ivana, with the sound of the drone and the idea that if you hear the sound of a drone in our environment in the US or somewhere where it's safe, it's like, oh, there's a drone and, you know, it's excitement. It's like, a, is it a video? Is it a film production? Is it a game? that same sound is horrifying in a war zone and so the idea of memory and sound to me is very interesting when it's the same frequency especially with the, so many um, kind of ideas of healing vibration i feel that it's really about the context and the environment that gives even that sound frequency the meaning so um, I know you're trying to address that as well, but I'm just curious 
and I never asked you this until I saw you kind of really wrap everything up into a narrative. I'm curious how you see the audiences here experiencing what you're trying to relate about, you know, the bomb sirens, for instance, which a lot of people never even heard here. Maybe there is a siren about an accident or, you know, a flood or something, but a natural disaster, but not real kind of violent attack. I think that's a really, the, the challenge of my work is sort of mm -hmm. um, like how we often overlook the, the sound in terms of sonic memories or conflicts. And even right now they're doing a lot of research related to uh, Ukraine and the war uh, in Ukraine and how the drones are um, sort of more important uh, in terms of like not more important but like more traumatic uh, for uh, people than air raid sirens and oh, really? uh, oh. how it's being uh, often overlooked when we um, when we talk about the the effects and traumas of the the war and conflict. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, I am interested in exploring that further, but I, I can, I don't, I almost don't want to, you know, create the trauma on other. No, of course, of course. Of course but <laughs> and, and not intending that in any way, um, but I think it's um, these conversations and the issues are, um, are sort of like for me they're um there are there's some freak so when they design these instruments they design them with a very particular idea that people would stand on and leave so if the air raid siren is on you it would physically activate nerves in your body to make you stand up so there's definitely particular uh, that's why it's being used now if you go to any nightclub in berlin they're using air raid sirens uh, a lot of times to activate the crowds and, 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 and a lot of DJs are using the sounds of sirens um, to sort of like, uh, as like a powerful tool to control uh, mass audience. So I think in that sense, it's really, uh, even though you didn't have the experience of being in a bomb shelter or being in these environments, I think it's also important to, to just look at the pure um, uh, tonal structure of these sounds and to look at the pure vibrations that are coming from them. So in that sense, I think it, it kind of goes back to, to, to your uh, connection at the very beginning that you make with these vibrations that we feel that not necessarily is something that's just like through, through sound itself. It, I think it's more complex than that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're joined by Gabe. Gabriel is also part of the Art Side Collective and the Atmosphere of Sound work that we're doing right now. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm really still processing it. It was such a phenomenal talk. I think um, I, I've been fascinated by the Zero Group and by Auto Piano and Hans Max specifically for a couple of years, um, but to hear the ways that their metaphysical explorations have filtered into such a real and um, um, urgent, pressing contemporary issues of politics and war and violence um, through your practice has been quite fascinating. I think my only question for you is, what have you learned about um, navigating your own memories and kind of allowing them to appear in your work in a way which still uh, allows you to maintain your center and provide a, a kind of um, a, a rock and a voice for the, uh, the viewers of your work? Um, what you've learned about your own process in reflecting back on these works you've created, um, what it's taught you about your own upbringing. Um, and I guess, I, I don't know, I, I have less of a, a question more. I would love to hear um, more about just what it means to deal with such poignant, visceral, and painful realities of war um, in a practice which can often be so healing. Um, I yeah I think it's like really thank you for being here and I think it's a really great question but I sort of I, like I will just kind of frame it back to I think that artists a lot of times are like children and that you are treating your studio space as this like kind of like mad scientist lab or like experimental place so a lot of times 99% of my work comes from play uh, and this is, sounds pretty maybe um, it doesn't sound 
great to say that if you're dealing with such important issues. No, but it's great to say it, especially when it's important issues. <laughs> so a lot of times I'm trying to experiment and see uh, what are the things that bring um, my attention forward and, uh, and um, sometimes is uh, I sometimes they are these connections that happen and like for example that I didn't include it in my presentation but that inflatable piece that I made I don't think I didn't have any any like sort of thinking uh, how it's related to this but then it later on starts making sense and I, I always think about these connections that happen afterwards. And, and I was um, in 2000, one of the collaborators that I'm inviting to uh, design these discs is Robert Aiki, who is like a really a great composer in New, working primarily in New York City. And um, he will be designing uh, one of the discs. But importantly, we met each other in 2018 when I was passing by the store in Brooklyn called Control. Out of all titles, the name is Control. <laughs> and it was, I was just drawn to it visually. I didn't know what the modular synthesizers were. And I didn't even know that they had the modular synthesizers. So I just walked into a store and I talked to them that I was using some software based like Max MSP and uh, other softwares. And I was like talking to them about that. And they're like, oh, if you like that, then this is going to make so much sense and i was like oh yeah but i don't know anything about this and then well, five hours later I, I was still in the store playing with um, the synthesizers and i was just purely as a almost like kid like um and or like animal like you're attached to something you can't explain why you're attached to it and then years later um these connections start making sense and then um i think actually victoria sent me this documentary uh, called Delian Mode that is talking about um, David Shear's work and in relationship to her uh, traumatic experiences in UK and how she integrated that into her, like she's one of the pioneers in electronic music and how that made into the work um, and then you're watching other other connections and like another documentary was like Sister with Transistors and all these women that are talking about early interest that they had in uh, electronic music and how they entered from science labs to the scene that was not open for women at that time. So I, I do think that all these connections start making sense later, but they come to me as like playful experiments that, um, and thank you, Anu, for including all these references in the chat as I speak. So I appreciate that. So hope that answered your question. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you. And Robertina is joining us, which is wonderful. Robertina is part of the Atmosphere of Sound uh, exhibition, and she's going to visit us next week, and I'm going to bring her into my class along with Lena Ortega, which is fantastic that both of you are here. And Ice and uh, Carol Justine will also join. So it's a wonderful group of uh, a new generation of women with transistors. <laughs> Did you want to say something, Robertina? Yeah, first of all, uh, congrats, Ivana. Like, I'm really happy to also finally have this time to listen to your practice also, because, you know, with Ivana, we have been in different constellations since you and Victoria Vesna collaborate so closely. So it's also nice to hear what you're actually thinking, doing, and what is your um, way of working. I think the combination of playfulness and heavy topics is anyway needed because, you know, topics which you addressed, you know, especially the memories of the wars and um, of these different dramatic situations can be sometimes too heavy to go through it otherwise. Like I'm also coming from Balkans, from Slovenia, so Growing up uh, in the war time, you know, this kind of saying, yes, we live in the unprecedented times. I don't know, it's happening for me since I was 10 years old. So all these kind of changes and changes of the systems and living in different constellations of that, I think is also kind of a bit resonating with um, my art practice, in, but also in general, you know, with uh, the backgrounds which I'm coming from. So. Just to reflect to this, Ivana, what you have been saying, the displayfulness, I think it's very needed, you know, 
and I, agree. I was I agree. Mm -hmm. And I think all of you, like especially the ones living in LA, can relate with the earthquake situations because this is also this kind of something which I experienced. The one together also when I met Lena Ortega actually the same year. In Mexico City was this heaviest earthquake and one of the really strange experience just like on the personal note for me was that I can't remember the sound. And I was there and I was running out and I'm pretty sure it was super loud. But kind of, um, and this is the thing which I think even though you have been addressing so beautiful inside of your talk and I would just like to reflect on that is the thought on um, self-protection in the contrast to the control mm. you know like where the self-protection is kind of the needed um, situations that you can work through it and where the control starts and this is also something which i'm also many times rethinking when you have been speaking about this before um i don't know if i make sense but <laughs> where do you Reflect yourself with that, you know, because one thing is, you know, as you have been also in this kind of, when you speak about this um, trigger situations of vibrations of presence of something. And I think this also reflects to the drone situation, because I was reading a lot about into this, how the presence of the drones, what was happening in, um, because if I'm correct, but maybe I'm wrong, they have been very heavily introduced into the more military actions during the Afghanistan situations and so on. So it's happening already for a long time. It's just depending where in geography of the world we are, we are more or less aware of it. And it's either more um, on the scary side, on this side. Like for me, you no. Know, always when I hear the sirens, it triggers me a bit because it reminds me on situation in Mexico City, you know, and here they're just doing the test for the something. So yeah. Exactly. Thank you for for comment. And I I, I constantly think about um, I mean it's it's really bizarre how one time I was with a friend in a car accident and there was a really a dumb song that we were playing on in a car. And so all of a sudden that song became like a like a buzzing sound and you don't hear it anymore and then you come back and you're like i can't believe this like you know if something more dangerous happened this would be the song that was playing at that time uh but in the very particular moment you don't hear it um you almost like something that you mentioned earlier that there's like this like i don't remember it uh, or there is the moment of like being like almost like numb and your senses are uh, your body is just responding of like how fast I have to react to this um, um, element of urgency in the body and and that that's something that uh, again goes to your con idea of control and this like uh, I, I did work with um, I was interested in like looking into eye movement and how we think that we're in control of our body and then we have this involuntary blinking that we can control so I always look in these moments of how how we're not aware of these. You can only go so far without blinking. At some point, you have to blink. Um, so I'm I'm interested in in that very much. So in our perception of control and and also these utopian ideas of controls that kind of and Soviet era and everything. Um, so I'm yeah I'm just grateful. I don't think I can answer um, this in a short. Time. The longer discussion. <laughs> longer discussion. So nice to have you, Robertina. Thanks for being here. And Sally Weber, I'm so happy you joined us today. Wonderful artist who's also part of the Romance collection. Well, it's great to be here. And Ivana, your work is fantastic. Congratulations. It's really um, succinct and very elegant and that's always um that's always a sign of as victoria said it's both a maturity but it's also subtle and then it hits people straight through the solar plexus they get it they don't need to think about it they don't need it to be emotion they don't need it to be anything that's part of kind of real communication so i really 
I really loved what you're doing. Um, I have a couple things to add, and one is about auto. And um, I think trauma was actually what inspired him and the Zero Truth Group. And because they were all growing up, of course, during World War II and the Nazi era, he was a Nazi youth. And this was, you know, tremendous, tremendously um, disturbing to him. And I think that part of the 60s was countering that kind of negativity. So the, uh, the exuberance they were trying to bring back to a new world was coming straight out of that. The sky art inflatables were inspired by the, uh, the bombings and what they looked like in the sky. So they were directly part of that experience and trying to redirect that emotion into something positive. And certainly when he incorporated or he worked with uh, Mormon and um, oh, and all the other artists in the Sky Art events, um, that was part of redirecting that kind of energy. Basically the 20th century has been, you know, a century of, of trauma and mm -hmm. wars straight through and i'm sorry that you've had to go through that on a personal experience but your way of seeing through that is what's helping other people today you know both older and younger than yourself because mm -hmm. it ain't gonna it ain't gonna stop anytime soon we're afraid mm -hmm. um the other just quick comment was i'm sure you've looked into um phonographic discs that are about the same size that you've seen there. Um, uh, some years ago, we were at someone's house and they had a collection of these. And so they came out, you know, a little after the Edison reels and um, the Ed Edison cylinders as another way of like having a, a mechanical phonograph. And so the sound and in collaborating with your other artists, there might be voicings and music and things that uh, we can do now with AI or through some of the other technologies that will allow a broadening of what we can put onto something and still have it as beautiful as what you've already been doing sonically. And so the sonic and the visual are so well connected that there is no distinction. And I think that's what you've done so masterfully. So. I don't know. Those were just some thoughts. Um, I think you're doing fine. I don't have anything to ask because you're already <laughs> doing it. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I just want to mention that I was really, uh, I, I knew of Sally's work before we met um, when you did your episode for Color Light Motion. And the work that you were doing at MIT was really uh, inspirational to artists like myself and a lot of people who were at the same time in, in the school with me. Uh, I just want to briefly, briefly, very briefly comment on, on the sort of this historical element that I really kind of overlooked in my talk and I think it was important. More the perspective that I was thinking is that I wish it was talked about because a lot oftentimes our history is not talking about um, actually all three members of uh, like uh, starting members of zero group were in military themselves and had uh, some sort of military training or experience and I think all of these uh, conversations about the time and reflection on the uh, sort of the the, the artist is reflection of what's happening outside as well and I think a lot of times we think about the, the protest in more direct way that we have to kind of be loud and and be outside and, and kind of and like I don't know like do something um, but I have a feeling mm -hmm. that there's many many different ways to deal with these complex um, complexities um, and some of them are uh, if we look at the non-western thinking and traditions in like I don't know even Buddhism and how a lot of times is about um, centering and that the protest can be uh, as quiet and in, internal and the, 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 these kind of different approaches to 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 same exact uh, source. So I, 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 I'm not uh, just um, my main critique of the zero group was primarily um, sort of on, on how little it was talked about that the mm -hmm. idea was 
start fresh, start new, and re like kind of like reconstruct from blank. And I think a lot of times you're building off of each other instead of like you know starting from zero. But I'll, I'll, I, I, I <laughs> no I, pun intended. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sally, well, I'm curious if, uh, did you meet Otto? Uh, did I you studied with him. He was my advisor. Wait, you didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was my advisor at MIT. That's amazing. So you mm -hmm. need to tell yeah. us more. Tell us oh, more. Oh, well, he was a force. You know, mm -hmm. it, he was a real force at the center. And uh, he was the one that spearheaded the whole Sky Arts program, uh, much to the chagrin of many of the artists in the program um, who were fellows, because, you know, everybody was, you know, going into lots of different directions. And uh, so suddenly, uh, while I was there, um, before God, uh, that they, he was trying to bring the center all into one Kind of collaborative to pull off these festivals it was there was three of them and uh it was to bring artists and scientists and technologists all together so it was the beginning of this whole program to even though it had been going for quite a few years it was the beginning of bringing a number of people together to have a conference basically, to have a conference and talk about all these ideas. And of course, at the time, art and technology was not part of the major art world the way it is now. It was very much a side field and the idea of trying to be noticed by, um, as artists working in a field was sort of not on anybody's mainframe, especially from New York. So even though we were in Boston and New York should be a tight connection, it really wasn't. But the whole idea of bringing in people like Morrison and um, Vincent and all these major artists, as well as Namjoon Pike, who was a close friend, um, and a lot of artists worked together. A very close friend of mine worked directly with Namjoon for uh, a long time. This is just what they did and what we did. I was a student, a graduate student at the time. So there was a small graduate student program and a number of fellows. There was probably at least 30 fellows or something, uh, 20 to 30. And then there was four or five graduate students each, um, each year. So, um, but what that did for us as graduate students was give us access to the Institute which was an incredible boon. I mean, to me, it was allowed me to explore things I couldn't have done anywhere else because I was looking for access to lasers. I was trying to figure out stuff about holography. I had worked with a woman named Harriet Caston Silver, who I took a night course with, which was what introduced me to the center. And, um, that got me into holography, but my interest in solar and my interest in sunlight and archaeoastronomy at the time is what shifted that into a whole different direction. So, um, you know, at the time, I didn't know Otto's work at all. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until later, and I did see the exhibition at the Guggenheim, which was excellent. But Ivana should know, if you're at Yale, um, his archive is up in Massachusetts. And um with his his wife and uh there's a possibility perhaps that if you're interested in something specific i could try and um get in touch in touch with them and see whether there's an option if if you needed to have gain some access for instance um if that would be helpful for some of, of your course, research of course it would be helpful and we're you know the big and there's point. the cat of course, oh, the wonderful. cat had to show had to show wonderful. up. <laughs> I love that you picked it up. <laughs> but I was just starting to say that the whole point of even today's program is to show how the very new generations are taught have this lineage, and just as uh, even as work as an example, a lot of it comes from the unconscious. A lot of uh, students of mine kind of do work that I know 
has happened before in a different form, in a different time, a different technology. So to bring in this collection and just show that lineage is so important. And these stories are critical. Unfortunately, a lot of the artists we weren't able to access directly, like Otto, he passed away too soon. Uh, but we have someone like you, who's an amazing artist, but then has that lineage and has that direct relationship. So we get to hear these stories. It's quite wonderful. And the, the, the idea no of cross-generational, intergenerational is also so great because the, you have some very, you know, powerful, instinctual kind of movements and that's connected to layers of experience and knowledge and history. It's, it's great. And Carol, uh, I'm so happy that you hang in there. I know you have an event, so you're amazing to do this. But Carol, Hark you, you're just really a, a force yourself. I'm going to try and um, activate were... my microphone. Hopefully there's no feedback. But um, doing good. we doing really good. enjoyed having Ivana as an artist in residence. I think it was last year or the year before. So she um, brought her newly discovered uh, synthesizer love to the piece uh, that we showed on Governor's Island. So we're hoping to work with uh, Ivana more in the future. And I had no idea it was her first time at Control. That was awesome. <laughs> so, we're we're uh, collaborating on the atmosphere of sound uh, sound art in times of climate disruption with harvest works and a big idea is to connect east and west coast and there's such a boom of artists and it was really hard for Anurada and I to just narrow it down to what we can do just physically, budgetary, etc. Uh, so we did decide to come up with a symposium, performative symposium uh, that will be in 2025, where it's a bit of a marathon, you know, the, just everybody coming together, making noise, <laughs> white noise, pink noise, good noise, bad noise, whatever is happening, just to kind of put it out there and work with the light. And, and this has been so delightful to me, really close to my heart. And even though we're so grateful to you um, for being there, for being one of the community. And um, as Pauline Oliveira said, we're not here to build careers, we're here to build communities. You're really showing that. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody. Ross Whiteman, thank you for joining and being part of this. Sally, your last Good words were fantastic. Anna. Everybody else is just such a great community that came together here that it really is warming my heart. Thank you, everybody.